Hi there, I'm Jen, this is Remembered Reads, and this is going to be the edge of reading tag, which I think is more about language than it is about reading, so this should be fun. This tag was created by Grix Etc, and I was tagged by Brian from Bookish. I will link to both of their videos below. Prompt number one is to ask your definition of reading, or to accept Grix Etc's definition. And his definition was, reading is the act of interpretation of symbols systematically put together in a certain sequence that allow the reader to extract meaning from them in an active form of creation that can develop into complex narratives. The sequencing, I think, depends on language because a lot of languages are not strictly tied to sequence and there are writing systems like bliss symbols or lexigrams that are even less tied to that, maybe less so bliss symbols than lexigrams, and then we can argue about whether lexigrams count when they're used with non-human primates and do they have language? Is that proto-language? Do you need the fibrous connection between Procasaria and Vernicasaria to say that it's a language? I don't know. However, it's a good enough one for the one meaning of reading, which is you pick up a book and you're either looking at, your eyes are looking at text or your fingers are touching a tactile system like Braille. Yes, you're interpreting symbols. I think within a general context, reading has a lot of other meanings which don't fall into this. I think in a booktube context, reading also includes listening to audiobooks, which is cognitively not the same thing. Some, I've seen some people argue that it is, which is clearly not true because when you are listening to an audiobook you're activating conversation centers in the brain and not the quote-unquote uh, visual cortex, and I'm saying air quotes because the same decoding center that is used for text is used for people reading braille, even people who have never had eyesight. So that decoding center is not activated when you're using the conversation centers and you're listening to an audiobook. Which is not to say it's not reading in the sense that the other definition that you're using when you say, did you read this book, is have you consumed the content, which is not exactly the same as has your brain done the decoding work. Um, so it's one of those things, it's like when people have the argument about audiobooks are cheating or audiobooks are exactly the same as reading and they're both kind of missing the point. Anybody who's had this conversation with me in the comments of one of their videos will know I always bring up Benson syndrome, which is a form of atypical dementia in which rather than people losing their memories first, they lose the access to that decoding center. And so those people can still listen to an audiobook and understand the story. They cannot read text or braille or anything symbolic. So we're talking about digits, things like the signs on the street that tell you you need to merge, or the signs on the street that tell you that the lane ends. So things like that are gone because they don't have the symbolic decoding ability. If you kicked somebody out of your book club because they were listening to an audiobook because they had Benson syndrome, you're a terrible person. So hopefully the people who are like, oh, it's cheating, should surrender when they say that. But at the same time, people who say it's exactly the same, it's not the same process. So both of these people are wrong, but uh, anyway, which always infuriates me when people have the audiobook discussion because you can't say, because you can say these things are equally good ways of consuming the material, but you cannot say they're exactly the same. And if you put some moral superiority on one of them, you're just a bad person. <laughs> so, come on. All right, enough of that though. That's one definition of reading that works, but I think we say reading and mean multiple things. Given your chosen definition, are reading and interpretation the same thing? If not, do they differ? So if we're talking about reading as interpreting symbols, then reading involves interpretation, but we do so much interpretation that is not reading. Maybe all reading involves interpretation, but not all interpretation involves reading. Next prompt. Are there any practices that you consider reading but that would not fit other definitions of reading? When we use the expression read the room, or when, spe more specifically, if you're saying are you capable of reading your dog's body language? Because this is something that comes up in my life as somebody who has dogs and has had dogs for a while, and I regularly meet people who obtained their first dog during the pandemic, and because things were closed, they couldn't be socializing, aren't necessarily good at reading a dog's body language. Now some people will call that speaking, like do you speak dog? But I think it's more commonly in English called reading body language. So that is not reading in the way we're talking about decoding. It has elements of that because you are looking at something and interpreting what does that mean? Does the slow wag, because that's a thing that a lot of people will talk about, like okay, is this dog's hackles raised? Is that in an aggressive way? Is it in a confrontational way? Is this dog's tail wagging? Is it a fast wag? Is it a slow wag? Because that's the thing, like a, a lot of people have the idea that if a dog is wagging its tail, it's happy, and 
it depends how it's wagging its tail because there are different levels to that that people don't get. And I find that really interesting, especially I have a dog who is very into wrestling. If you follow me on Instagram, you'll have seen her wrestling much larger dogs. Sometimes she's with people who are new, newer dog owners. Their dog is only two or three years old, which should be a mature adult dog. And under normal circumstances, someone would presumably be better at interpreting dog body language. But, uh, and they're often asking, okay, they're happy, right? Because the wrestling and my dog is also very vocal. So they'll hear this kind of noise and they think, well, growling is bad and tail wagging is good. So what does it mean if you have these two things together? And then you can explain that's not actually a growl. That's a different kind of vocalization. You can see the hackles are down. You can see the play bowing that's happening in between that they're taking turns, which dog is on top. And yes, I use the word reading when I talk about that, about reading bo uh, dog body language, but is it reading in this sense? Obviously not. The next question is, is there an ideal reading experience for you? And is there a book that represents it? And no, because I think reading, even when we're talking about the decoding bit, is so various, right? I mean, maybe you're reading, like if I'm reading a work of fiction or I'm reading a work of nonfiction, the, uh, the, the type of interpretation that you're doing post decoding, like you have worked out what the words are and what you're doing with that and the context that you're putting it into are very different. And I think outside of books as well, like if I'm driving down the highway and there is a sign and I can see that it has times on the screens because we have these screens that if there's an accident, it will tell you X lane is closed. If there's just slow traffic, it'll tell you 30 minutes to Pearson, which is the airport that's just outside of Toronto, or 70 minutes to Pearson and then you'll think, oh no, the traffic is bad. But if the traffic is average, it just has a sign that says something like, don't drive high and conduit pas gelé or something like that. And yes, for my non-Canadian French speakers, gelé is how you say hi here. It is not in French in Africa and Europe and etc. So there you go, you learned something. And drunk is show. So yes, if you're stoned, you're frozen. If you're drunk, you're hot. <laughs> That's, nobody cares. My point is, it's more interesting to read the sign on the highway when there is a traffic problem and you have to consider that, it is less interesting when it's a generic warning about don't drive under the influence. <laughs> yeah, but does that, is any of that ideal? It's not ideal because you're thinking, oh no, there's a traffic jam. But I mean, it's useful, but I don't think that's really the question. Yeah, so no, there's, um, <laughs> I don't even know what I'm saying now. So anyway, if there's an ideal, it would follow that there is a scale of value to reading and what is at the bottom. And I don't think you can put anything at the bottom because it really varies depending on what you're looking for. If you're looking for engagement with a text because you're reading for fun, then that would be at the top in that particular moment. If you are looking to repair your car, you're probably reading the manual and that is not fun. But if you get the right information, that's the important part. If you're looking to win a political argument, so you need to read a really long history, this is also, you know, so you're looking for a very different experience. So. Um, and I think even things that are poorly done, like, like for example, this collection of Sabahatin Ali's stories is so poorly translated that it feels like it was put through Google Translate, which means that there are mistakes in the word order and there are mistakes in the genders, for example, because this is a translation from Turkish into English. And if you put it through an audio translator, the AI will usually not know how to translate non-gendered languages. Uh, by which I don't mean grammatical gender, I mean if you don't have a distinct he and she like English does, because obviously if you're translating from a language like French or Spanish, you, then you have more gendering. But um, So this is a bad translation which makes it almost unreadable, unless you are reading it for the fun of seeing how poorly that translation is and what happens when you let something that is not a person do the translation. So it's fascinating. It's simultaneously basically unreadable as stories, but fascinating as a language exercise or as a translation exercise. So even, even if you put that at the bottom in terms of, I don't know, engagement, it's still fantastic in terms of uh, what you learn, the human touch in translation. So here you go. Next prompt. Is reading as the art of associating symbols and creating meaning out of them a predecessor of language or does it come after as a consequence of those languages? Well, obviously language predates writing, so it's obviously uh, a consequence of language and not an inevitable consequence of language because language, I mean, writing has arisen 
independently a number of different places, but not universally. There have, are all kinds of languages that were only codified within the past hundred years when coming in contact with cultures that had already codified their languages. Uh, and going back to postcortical aphasia, you can not be able to read at the decoding level and still be able to speak and communicate. So they're completely separate items. Now, I mean, I think there's undoubtedly a buildup towards recording things just from a practical level that you see in prehistory when you see almost pseudo calendars that are pictographic, but you're not getting quite to the level of a pictographic language. You know, going back to cave paintings, because we assume that the Cro-Magnon, Cro-Magnon, whatever you call that, uh, that they probably had human language, although you have to find the brains to know, do they have that fibrous connection between Broca's and Wernicke's area, which I think is the main thing that we say now, that that's the distinction between humans and other, uh, and our closest relatives like chimps and bonobos, so. But yeah, reading comes far, far, comes much further along. I mean, that would be a fascinating science, work of science fiction, though, to create a species who had come up with writing before they had come up with language itself. And I, I almost said speech, but that's not true because, when, again, when you look at aphasia cases, you, you will see people who speak signed languages will lose the sign language but not lose gesture. So the fact that it is a manual language versus a spoken language is not different from the way it's stored in the brain. Language is stored in a language center and, you know, has crossover when you speak more than one and that's why they talk about being bilingual or multilingual doesn't stop you from developing in aphasia but it gives you kind of a backdoor back in because you're taking up so much more brain space or creating, it's not really space, you're creating more connections so there are more neurons firing in different places that maybe you can get around but gesture is separate from a signed language signed language is stored the same way as a spoken language so so if you created a written language before you created a, a spoken or signed language that would be a fun science fiction project right because It, well, it, it, it couldn't be, right? Because then it would be symbolic of, because it can't be symbolic of ever, anything, which is what reading is. So what are you decoding if you don't have the language first? That's an interesting problem. See, we don't know enough about the brain. That's one of the problems. There's so much more research that has to be done on that. Uh, next prompt is, is everything that can be read slash with meaning a language? And no, because one of the things that people lose with postcortical, with postcortical atrophy is things like those road symbols, this lane ends, and that's not a language, it's just a symbol. So, but you are reading it in the decoding sense. So reading has to be separate from language that way. And obviously <laughs> reading your dog's body language is not a language in the sense that we would use language, like the, the level of complexity that a linguistics definition of language would be, would not include things like the communication systems of dogs, even though, again, should there be a listing of general communication systems ramping up to a kind of proto-language, like what you see with uh, howler monkeys or something, right? That is an argument that people have been having for decades, so I don't know the answer to that, but um, I think colloquially we might refer to that as a language. Right. We're reading it. So we're reading this language, even though we're not reading it in that brain decoding sense and it's not a language in the linguistic sense. So uh, who knows, man? Who knows? Next prompt is mention a few languages that defy the conventional conception of what a language is. And could a book be written in any of those languages? And so Grix, etc. mentioned things like um, music and mathematics and uh, I come from a family of engineers and my mother loves to say that math is a language and on one level that's true in the sense that it's a system and it's a communication system but is it a language according to linguistic definitions that becomes complicated because here's the other thing when you look at people with postcortical atrophy they can't do uh, sums anymore. They lose mathematical ability, but they still have the ability to speak and understand spoken language. Um, 
and they lose mathematical ability at a level that is actually higher than people with like Alzheimer's, traditional Alzheimer's type dementia where they've lost their memory. So you can lose your, so you can lose episodic memory and still do math at a higher level than people who have lost the use of their decoding center can do math. So math is more like writing and is less like language if you think about it from that perspective. And music again is something you can read, but music is stored again in different parts of the brain, which is why it's used with like with people who have aphasia, they can often sing or pray because that's that's stored a similar way, so these kind of rote things. Um, far, you know, at a far higher le ability level than they can speak or sometimes than they can understand. So again, you're, you're talking about a different part of the brain. So it utilizes language at one level. I mean, this is like when you go and watch operas sometimes and you can often tell the singers who understand what they're singing at a gut level because they actually speak the language versus the ones who have learned it phonetically and understand what it's speaking because they've seen a translation of the libretto. But it doesn't really change the quality of the singing. Like you're still, if you're still hitting the high notes in the aria, you're still singing those words and it's aside from the language. So I would say that's something different if we're using that decoding definition. Now, if we're not using the decoding definition, then I think there's an argument to be made that all of these things are languages in the same way that, that you know, music, mathematics, dogs wagging their tail, merge here, this lane ends. But if we're using either which brain areas are involved or what would be the definition linguistically, then I guess they're not. All right, next question. The next and final question is, if you could boundlessly read slash understand the meaning in one of those languages, which would it be and why? Birds, I have birds that nest just outside this window here. I wanna know what they're saying. But again, that's not considered a language by linguistic definitions. So um, what are you gonna do? But I do think it would be fun to see what birds would write, right? That would be fun. Because I regularly joke that, you know, when the birds are especially loud, because it, this is a bird family, it's the parents and they had a nest with, I don't know how many eggs hatched, but they had a few there. And uh, I like to joke about their domestic dramas when they wake me up at 4.30 in the morning. So I want to know what they're saying. And plus it would be fun in terms of <laughs> how do birds perceive the world? We want to know that. That would be the interesting stuff. All right, um, that was the end of the question. So I am going to tag a couple of people. Actually, I'm gonna tag a couple of people who have tagged me in things that I haven't done. I'm going to tag uh, on Novella, who technically her dog Muffin tagged my dog Tally in the dog tag, which I haven't done. And also uh, Raina from Rainer Books, who tagged me in the New York tag, which I am in a mess of editing New York City footage. <laughs> from two years ago that I've never put together. So I'll do that eventually. But anyway, I think both of them would have interesting responses to this. So there we go. Um, and of course, if you are watching this and you think this would be fun to do, which I think it would be, please consider yourself tagged. And that's it for now.